Okay. I'm Nat Goodspeed. I've been coding in C++ since the turn of the century. Recently, the C++ community has been focusing on the topic of how best to express concurrency in a C++ program. Of course, you already know this. That's why you're here this morning. Concurrency itself has a broad range of meanings. It can mean different cores stepping through different instruction streams in the same clock cycle. With processes and threads, operating systems take some care to keep you from having to worry about how many cores you actually have on hand. As soon as the number of concurrent tasks exceeds the number of cores, those tasks are transparently interleaved. Sometimes, though, for various reasons, you want to be more explicit about the interleaving. That's where coroutines and fibers come in. When I first started reading about the Boost coroutine library, I was dismayed by what seemed to me to be important omissions. Where are the synchronization primitives? Where are the futures and promises? I was, in short, confused about the distinction between coroutines and fibers. What I hope to do this morning is to clarify that distinction for you guys. I'm going to start with a preliminary distinction. When I say fibers, some of you may be thinking specifically of Windows fibers. That is an implementation of the concept with help from the OS. But when I say fibers, generally I mean something quite like the proposed Boost Fiber library that was reviewed last January. Starting with coroutines. The most important thing to know about coroutines is that control transfer is explicit and immediate. Just like an ordinary function call, you pass control to the coroutine's entry point. Just like an ordinary function, when the coroutine returns, it passes control back to its caller. The big difference is that from the middle of a coroutine, you can choose to pass control back to the caller with the expectation of resuming later at the same point. The coroutine and its caller aren't even pretending to run concurrently any more than an ordinary function pretends to run concurrently with its caller. In the literature, coroutines come in two flavors, symmetric and asymmetric. A symmetric coroutine explicitly designates the next symmetric coroutine to which it will pass control. An asymmetric coroutine has a caller and a callee. As with an ordinary function call, the caller explicitly passes control to the callee, but the callee returns control to the caller without knowing its identity. The two types of coroutine API have equivalent expressive power, and Boost coroutine provides both. In practice, though, asymmetric coroutines tend to facilitate application-level use cases, whereas symmetric coroutines are better as building blocks for higher-level abstractions. So this morning, I'm going to focus on asymmetric coroutines. Boost's asymmetric coroutine API expresses an interesting design choice. When you instantiate a coroutine, you specify whether its function will provide values or receive values. When I first bumped into this, I immediately asked, but what if you need to pass values in both directions? Of course, that's possible, but I have yet to encounter a real use case. If you think of one, if you have already encountered one, I'd be interested to hear about it. When the caller instantiates a pull type coroutine, it retrieves a sequence of zero or more values. When the caller instantiates a push type coroutine, it provides a sequence of zero or more values to that coroutine. You can think of these as being like the sources and sinks of Boost IO streams. Right away, you get generator functionality. The generator can provide an infinite sequence. When the caller has seen enough values, it simply stops asking. If you're at all familiar with Python generators, asymmetric coroutines address all those use cases. It starts getting fun when you realize you can compose coroutines into chains. You know the Python iter tools module, concatenate sequences from other generators, item selection, and so forth. That becomes straightforward too. I mentioned Boost I.O. streams. You can build I.O. filtering 
in which each filter stage is written with its own loop, consuming input values, passing output values. Going beyond Python generators, we can flatten a recursive data structure into an iterator range that can be passed to an SQL algorithm. We can call that the chainsaw pattern because it flattens trees. But you already know all this. This is all in the Boost Coroutine documentation. This is just a quick review. It amuses me that the asymmetric coroutine API actually has a nice symmetry. When the caller instantiates a pull type coroutine, the coroutine function is handed a corresponding push type object. When the caller instantiates a push type coroutine, the, caller, the coroutine function is handed a corresponding pull type object. This morning I'm gonna focus on the case of an explicit pull type coroutine delivering values to its caller. So you define the type that's passed, the coroutine function is written to accept a reference to a push type, calls to the apply method on that push type object, send a value to the caller. The caller instantiates the pull type coroutine, uh, initializing it with the coroutine function that immediately transfers control to the function. And one of two things happens. The function returns or it decides to deliver a value. The uh, pull type has operator bool to distinguish the two cases. If there is a value, there's a get method to retrieve it. And there's an apply operator on the pull type to transfer control back to the coroutine to try for another value. I'd like to dive into what I think is kind of an interesting use case. Okay, we need to recursively parse an XML document. This is a solved problem. But the document size is completely arbitrary. Maybe you're working in a small embedded machine. Maybe it's coming from a stream. For whatever reason, you cannot assume you can fit a DOM into the machine's memory. Okay, this too is a solved problem. You get a SAX parser. I don't claim that this is the best parser for C++. I don't even claim it's best for this problem. I found it, it seemed okay, I used it. So, quick review of its API. You instantiate the parser, you register the callbacks, you call its parse method with an iStream containing the document. When it um, encounters various interesting events during the parsing of the document, it calls your registered callbacks and parse only returns when the document is done. If it hits an error, it throws an exception. That seems fairly straightforward. The start document callback takes a name, the outermost element name, and it takes an attribute iterator. This API is designed to avoid copying unless you actually ask for it. The tag type, which yes is a string, is passed by reference. And the attributes are retrieved from this thing they call an attribute iterator, which doesn't really behave like an iterator at all, but we'll gloss slightly over that. Um, you only retrieve things on demand and even the attribute iterator is passed to the callback by reference. So you have an end document, it accepts the, the name you have a start tag callback that gets the name and the attributes. These are, this is the start of any element except for the beginning of the document. Similarly, you have the end tag, which is called for the end of that corresponding element. <coughs> um, finally, for our purposes, there is a characters callback. Anytime the parser hits, runs through a stream of text, you get a char iterator. And again, you can retrieve exactly as much of the character data as you choose to or not. And the character iterator is itself passed by reference and we almost have all the pieces that we need except the business re logic requires recursive tra traversal of this XML. Don't talk to me about Turing equivalents. Let's say your boss requires recursive traversal of the XML. That's not gonna work out we are getting callbacks from the SACS parser. 
Every time we have dealt with an event, we have to return control to the SACS parser or it's not going to keep parsing. We can't build a recursive tree of invocations. But we might be able to have a second stack involved. So class hierarchy that represents the data that's passed to the callbacks. Um, the event, the end of either the document or a particular element binds a tag type. I'm binding a reference. I'm not copying the data here. The open has both a name, so I'm deriving from the close event, and also binding the attribute iterator, again by reference. There's a text event, which binds the carry iterator that you get in that callback. Okay, so the coroutine definition, the data type, is going to generate for us values of the subclasses of base event. Because it's going to be providing them polymorphically, we have to accept them by reference so we don't slice them. So the coroutine function body, it must take a push type object because it's a pull type coroutine. We also are going to bind the iStream that is going to be parsed. We instantiate the parser object and we start registering the callbacks. In this case, the callback is a lambda. The lambda takes the two arguments you saw earlier. It instantiates a temporary open event, binding the two references that, it was, that were passed to the callback, and hands the temporary open event to the push type object, meaning it hands it to the caller of the coroutine. Similarly for start tag, end tag, same thing, except we're instantiating a close event. And end document, again, a close event. OK, so we have a parser function, which instantiates the XML parser and calls its parse method. This is after we've registered all of the callbacks. That's with the dot, dot, dot. And of course, we're going to wrap it in try catch so that um, we can deal with any errors that arise. Now, one peculiarity of this particular XML parser is that it throws an enum. I wanted to get a standard string. So uh, this exception name function is actually a translation that I wrote and I provide it as the what string for a standard runtime error. Okay, the code that is going to recursively process my XML. Um, it needs to receive the pull type um, coroutine object by reference. Um, I have an indent um, string whose whole function is to rub our noses in the fact that yes, this is recursive processing. And this process function is called in response to receiving an open event. So we take the open event as a parameter in addition to the event source from which we got it. And just for fun, we return the close event that will terminate this level of recursive processing. OK, so up to this point, when I receive an open event, when I get that call, when I receive a start tag callback from the XML parser, I'm handed a reference to a tag name. I instantiate an open event object which binds that reference. I then pass a reference to the open event to the caller of the coroutine. At this point, all I have is references. I actually want to save the tag name for later. So I'm going to reach through the reference to the open event, reach through its name reference, and actually copy the M name into a local variable. So we now have to retrieve the next event. We entered the process function in response to a, a 
either a start document or a start tag callback, we have to pass control back to the SACS parser so we get the next event. Um, and what's fun about this while events expression is that the apply operator returns a reference to the same pull type object, which also supports operator bool. So this is shorthand for two different method calls. One is the apply operator to pass control back to the coroutine, and then when we return from that call, we test whether we have a value in hand. Now that we know that we do, we can get that event. Since what we're getting is a reference to the base event, to one of its subclasses, we simply bind the reference. So now I can take that base event and dynamic, dynamic cast it to an open event star to test if it's this particular subclass. If it is an open event, I recursively call the same process. I am going to uh, pass the pull type coroutine object, the open event that we just de detected, and I'm going to add to the indent just because. If it's a close event, um, <laughs> this is just because I can, not because it's necessary, but I'm comparing the close events tag name to the tag name we stored in a couple of slides ago. And again, just because I'm returning the close event. And with a text event, um, I throw it on standard C out with the indent. Okay, I now have the driver code for illustrative purposes. I'm starting with a string. I'm initializing an iString stream. Pretend it's an IF stream of arbitrary size. So instantiate a pull type coroutine, passing the parser function that you just saw. Um, remember that the parser function accepts the push type object and it has to have a reference to the iStream that it's going to parse. And so I have to bind, yes, I could have used a lambda. Um, the parser function, I want a callable whose only parameter is the pull type. Sorry, it's going to be the push type that is handed to it by the coroutine framework. And I'm binding a reference to the iStream stream. When I instantiate the pull type, I immediately pass control to it. This is a function call. So when I fall out of that statement, I'm back for the first time from one of those callbacks. And in general, it might or might not have produced a value. In this case, for this function, it better have produced an open document callback. <laughs> so I'm asserting that I do have a value available. And moreover, I'm downcasting events.get, the base event reference that I'm returned. And because I'm casting to a reference, that itself is an assertion that I'm downcasting correctly. Since I believe at this point that I have an open event in my hand, I'm going to start the top level recursion calling the process function. And remember, we pass to the process the pull type. We pass the open event that we just retrieved in a sec and start the indent. Yes? That looks dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm assuming that whatever uh, events.get returns is invalidated the next time you let the coroutine run. Yes. That would mean that this context would be invalidated the moment the process uses gets the next event. Seems you're like very easy to misuse the dangling reference. Though. You're correct that it becomes dangling. That could have been better structured. For example purposes, I wanted it to be references. And I'll delve into that a bit more later. So I'm calling the top level of process. And of course, I wrap the whole thing in try catch. and. If there's an error, I'm going to produce a parsing error message. This is my arbitrary sized IF stream. 
And when I hand it to the code you just looked at, I get indented output of the text elements. I vary the input so as to deliberately introduce an error. Uh oh, I produce my parsing error. Okay, so when I talk to people about coroutines, one of the things that they often say is, well, why bother? This could be done with a thread or with multiple threads. The thing is, in this case in particular, and I submit in the number of use cases that exist in the real world, you don't want to use threads. We're talking about callbacks from a library. We're talking about this back and forth dialogue between the library and its caller. It doesn't make sense for either of them to get ahead of the other. But if we were using threads, uh, we would have to pass the base event subclass objects from the parser thread to the consumer thread using a thread safe queue. It would be polymorphic, so we actually have to make it a heap object and pass a pointer. The base event subclasses bind references to transient parser objects, as you were noting. So you would have to make, for instance, the close event store a copy of the tag type instead of binding a reference. But attributes and text, the callbacks get attribute iterator or char iterator. Copying the iterator into the object is not enough. You have to copy each of the data items that come from it, which in fact is all of the pertinent data in the XML document. This is the XML document that we doubted we could fit into memory. When you're using coroutines, as we just did, the parser coroutine instantiates a temporary stack object. It passes the business logic a const reference to that temporary. The temporary binds references to transient objects. And all of this happens in the within the duration of a single callback. So all of these references are valid at that time. My recursive process routine was ill-designed, you are right, but that's not the fault of the mechanism. Um, I didn't actually dereference any of the attribute iterator data that I got. My program did not care about the attributes of the elements I was encountering. So I didn't copy them. I didn't fetch them. I didn't look at them. How about exceptions? If I were using multiple threads, I have to catch the exception at the source, convert it to an exception pointer, pass the exception pointer on my thread safe queue, notice it on the receiving end, rethrow the exception. With coroutines, drum roll please, all I have to do is catch the exception. Yes? Um, a couple questions about the stack that's created for the coroutine. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know um, about the coroutine library. Does it guarantee that it allocates enough stack or that it dynamically allocates stack so that there's no um, surprising stack overflow in the coroutine? It's a good question. Repeat the question. Does the coroutine library guarantee to allocate a big enough stack or is the stack dynamically allocated? The answer to both questions, well, no, I won't say the answer to both questions is yes. The answer to the first question is you can actually tell the coroutine library how big a stack to allocate if you doubt that it's big enough. The answer to the second question is recently, both GCC and Clang have introduced the ability to have dynamics, dynamically sized stacks, which I think is fabulous. I don't think a, an application coder should have to think about how big the stack is going to have to be any more than you have to think about it when you write a console program now. Other questions? Yes. Okay. That would seem to blow the stack on the uh, processing side. 
even you know, it doesn't it har it, it handles arbitrarily large XML that is flat, but if it just goes deep forever. That's true. If you were in a truly restrictive environment, you would have to worry about the structure of the XML document. Um, truthfully, the um, restricted environment is more to motivate the problem of recursive SACS parsing than because I'm working in a restricted domain. And one more question. Um, yep. It works, uh, your last statement about exception, just catch, works okay if you own the SACS parser library and knows that it can unwind C++ exceptions. But if you're using some sort of platform specified binary SACS parsing library, then you can't throw through it. So you wouldn't just be able to catch in the code. I'm Okay, he's saying you wouldn't just be able to um, throw through a platform library that is not exception safe. And um, I agree with that. This library reports errors by throwing. So I leave to the library author the problem of making sure that when he throws, it's exception safe. Um, I wasn't throwing exceptions in the code that was called during the callbacks. Um, in general, that might be a dubious thing to try to do. Um, but I was responding to exceptions generated by this particular library. More questions? Okay. Onward. I like to think of coroutines as a tactic for inverting control flow so that when you have a push type callback, you can transform it into a pull type request. This is what we saw with the SACS parser. We had callbacks wanting to hand me data. I was able to pass that from a coroutine into the calling program and request those events. Because I could request them by function call, I could build up a recursive stack in the processing code. Let's try it on another domain. Emboldened by our success with the SACS parser, let's try to write a simple coroutine that will pull async completion handler results. Because it's handy and because I presume a lot of you are already familiar with it, we'll use boost ASIO async operations. So local buffer, initiate the async operation. I'm passing a lambda, which, when I receive the length that's read, is going to construct a string from the buffer and pass it to the push type parameter object. Maybe not so much. This is a little bit of an issue. In the SACS parser case, I knew that when the parse method returned, I would get no more callbacks. Processing was completely done when the parse method returned. And so it was OK for me to register callbacks that would make use of the push type parameter to this function. In the code that I just tried to write, async read sum is going to call its completion handler when the IO subsystem delivers a result. I have no guarantees about when that will happen. So, you know, I initiate the async read sum. I pass it a lambda and I fall out of this function destroying in the process my local buffer, destroying in the process the push type object that was passed to this coroutine. That's not really going to fly. Maybe I need some way to block here. Maybe not. What would that mean? Well, you know, if we were just going to call basic stream socket read sum instead of async read sum, we'd block the whole thread. That isn't what we want. 
We don't want to block the thread. We specifically want async IO. What we really want is an operation that we can say, go and fetch this, come back to me while you're doing it, and then we'll do some other kind of notification when we're all done. We don't want the coroutine to exit, but we do want it to pass control back to the caller. We want somebody else to manage the coroutine's lifespan. We want to be able to return all the way back up to the top level event loop, let's say, without destroying the coroutine instance. And of course, we have to pass control to the IO service instance of ASIO so that that completion handler will ever get called. Okay, but you know, further, if we wanted to launch a coroutine, which is going to initiate an async operation, but it also launches another coroutine, which in initiates another async operation. The second one is going to hand control back to the first one, which might not actually be ready to run at that moment. In short, we want a scheduler. I know you're dying to tell me that Boost ASIO already supports coroutines. How does it do that? IO service is a scheduler for pending async IO operations. The coroutine is owned by its own completion handler. When you ask Booze ASIO to launch an async operation and you give it the completion token that means use a coroutine, it instantiates the coroutine. The completion handler is owned by the corresponding pending async operation, which in turn is owned by the IO service. But if you are using a library that isn't as clever as Boost ASIO, the fiber library is the other library that you want to know about. This builds on the coroutine library by adding a scheduler and synchronization operations. That is the essential distinction between them. When you instantiate a coroutine, you talk to it. When you launch a fiber, it's kind of thread-like in that it then has a lifespan of its own. Fiber imitates the standard thread API, but of course it is user space context switching. When you launch a fiber on a thread, you get a fiber scheduler on that thread. Yes. Uh, the author of Boost Fiber, sorry, the question was how standard compliant is Boost Fiber's imitation of the standard thread library? Um, the author of Boost Fiber went to some trouble to uh, emulate what existed of the Boost thread, sorry, of the standard thread API at that time. There were some divergences that were noted in the review in January. He has gone away and is working on bringing the library back for another round of review. And I have not seen the fruits of his efforts since then. Ownership. The scheduler is what owns a fiber. So this is where you get your fire and forget behavior. Calling code can launch a fiber and then not worry about owning it. And of course, blocking a fiber means that it passes control to the local scheduler, the thread local scheduler, to see if it can run another fiber on this same thread. And you can customize the scheduler. So if we want to build the pull data function that I was trying to write with coroutines using fibers, now I have promise. Now, I can get a future from that promise. I can pass my async read sum operation a lambda, which when I receive the length read, it's going to set instantiate a standard string from the buffer, 
and set the value of the promise. And this is the interesting part. Um, pull data does not return to its caller because we're doing a future get that blocks, in this case blocking, is returning to the fiber scheduler. In fact, ASIO also supports fibers. Um, and so the code that I just showed you there, which is built on promise and future, could be more succinctly written as this. Um, so in this case, we're executing an async operation, which in fact blocks. And we don't return to the caller of async read sum until we've got a result available. The blocking is fiber level blocking. It is not blocking the thread. ASIO has this cool mechanism whereby the caller of an async operation can specify to ASIO what should happen. Should the async operation deliver a future? Should it block something? Should it just call a callback? Um, there is machinery in ASIO's async operations to give you that power and Christopher Koloff has a proposal into the ISO committee to make that machinery available in general for standard library and for everybody's library implementations of async operations. But if we go back to pretending that we're using a third-party library without ASIO's flexibility, it's all very well to use this funny logic for one async operation. But what about business logic that requires many such calls? The function body will be swamped in ugly lambdas. But the great thing about fibers, just like stackable coroutines, is that we can use ordinary software encapsulation to manage the clutter. We don't have to annotate either of these functions in any way. We're using ordinary C++ compiler. This is entirely library code. We're not passing a special token from the business logic function into the pull data function. The caller of the business logic function is not aware of any underlying async calls. So again, why aren't we doing this on separate threads instead of spinning up fibers? A few different reasons. Many UI frameworks forbid you from touching any UI objects unless you are running on the UI thread specifically. Of course, you can ship tasks back and forth between threads, but it's straightforward to wake up on the UI thread and do the logic that you need to do there. You will no doubt shout me down when I get this wrong, but it is my belief that WinRT forbids you from blocking the calling thread. I also don't believe you have explicit control over what threads are running in WinRT land. It, uh, it only blocks you, or it only prevents you from blocking uh, on the UI thread. Interesting, okay. You block, uh, worker threads. Okay. Thank you. Um, a use case that I talked about at great length two years ago, and so will not um, rehash the harangue, is um, when you have a large body of legacy code with many references to static data. It is not defensible to take some chunk of that legacy code and just break it off and run it on a separate thread. You don't know what's going to happen. You can reasonably run legacy code that, with static references on a separate fiber because it's guaranteed that your fiber will not be colliding with somebody else's access, some other fiber's access to that same static data. You don't get data races if all you have is fibers. And there's performance and scaling. I have specifically not spoken about the relative performance of fibers and threads. 
I have specifically avoided presenting performance numbers. I fully expect fiber contact switching to be faster than kernel thread contact switching. But to me, that's a secondary point. To me, the crucial distinction between threads and fibers is the semantic difference between cooperative context switching and preemptive time slicing. It has been suggested that there is no point in introducing another library that emulates the standard thread API unless it outperforms standard thread by orders of magnitude. I expect that for many people, that will be one of the major advantages. But I disagree with the stance that it would be the only reason for such a library to exist. How are we doing? Questions? Wake up! Yes? I, as somebody who implements one of those libraries that does the very fine-grained um, threading, um, it would surprise me to think that there are people that would assert that a kernel switch, a kernel level switch is going to ever be faster um, than doing it in user space where you can just write some, you know, really nice assembly code. I mean, it's, it is orders of magnitude, but are there really people who are asserting that on any platform you're going to get faster context switches um, with the kernel threads than you would with an even half decent written the gentleman asserts that um, it would surprise him if anyone were to seriously uh, project that they would expect kernel thread context switching to be faster than user space context switching. And if I gave you the impression that that was the objection that I heard, then I'm sorry, I misspoke and I will try to clarify. I have heard from people that Kernel context switching is itself improving in speed. Like you, I cannot believe that it will ever match user space context switching. But neither of those is the specific point that I was trying to uh, address. The objection I heard is that we don't need, that the only reason to introduce a fiber library that emulates the standard thread API would be if it is provably orders of magnitude faster than standard threads using kernel threads. And I think that the performance benefit is a lovely benefit. I'm happy about it. But it's not, in my opinion, the only reason for such a library to exist. Yes. Are you familiar with like uh, the Go language, like uh, their, uh, uh, you know, like their coroutines and their channels? I mean, channels seems to be the abstraction that would work for a lot of these in a consistent way. Yep. I've read something about the Go language. Okay, the question is, am I familiar with the Go language? And am I aware of Go routines and channels? And I have read about Go. I have read about, I've, heard a couple of the video lectures. I have never used it. Um, the material that I've encountered so far is a little bit coy about whether Go routines are spun up within the same kernel thread or on separate kernel threads. I understand that the channel mechanism is intended to abstract that away so that you get um, you try to avoid data races between different Go routines, even ones operating on separate kernel threads. But all I have done is a little bit of reading and a little bit of watching of video lectures. That's, a, that's as deep as it gets with me. Um, and uh, so whether we can say there will be such a powerful and compelling abstraction as channels in C++ so that the problem of data races goes away. 
I'd love to see that abstraction. We may be close. Um, I don't think that it will eliminate the problem of data races written by people who <clears throat> come from a C background. Yes? So I'm going to try to understand the question better before I try to recast it. Okay. Okay. So the point is made that um, when you are running on separate threads, you have access to thread specific data. Um, if you are running multiple fibers on the same thread, then they are all sharing thread specific data. And in fact, that's the implementation of the fiber scheduler running within a thread. We find it via a thread specific pointer. But um, his question is, is there anything comparable, I believe, that's your question, in Fiberland? And the answer is yes, there is fiber-specific data. Um, the, in practice, I find that keeping the data that is transient on the stack as auto-variables uh, addresses my needs better than storing it in fiber-local data anyway. But yes, but uh, when I write code, I don't write all the code. I use code written by others. Mm -hmm. And this code could be, could you make use of further specific data, even if it is not a good guideline. Then how to take care of this when we uh, are working with fibers and we call third party code that we don't master if this code could get access to, to this further specific data. Right. So his point is that um, he's not writing all of the code that he is trying to run. There are third-party libraries or code written by people in his own organization that already use thread-specific data. What does he do about running such code on fibers that then start sharing the thread specific data between them. And what you're talking about is a one facet of a larger problem. The problem is that of how do I know the context, the execution agent, if you will, on which my code is running? What does it mean when I want to run something else in parallel? What does it mean when I want to block the current execution agent? What does it mean when I need to get access to a piece of data and share it with something else? How wide is the sharing and how much, how hard must I work to defend that data from race access? Um, the best I can say about that right now is that there are people working on the problem of what it means to have execution agents in C++ and what it means to have um, executors that manage the execution agents that are in play. Um, I see another question. Um, so just something of a follow-up. We, we found that it was very difficult to try to implement OpenMP using fibers without fiber-specific data. Mm -hmm. so I think and we, we, we tried quite hard to avoid having to add it. And I think there are perhaps some use cases where you can't just, you don't just have the freedom, and as you suggested, to um, mm -hmm. just put everything onto the stack. Um, and it, or it would involve you know, large rewrites or breaking APIs. So I, I do think it's a fairly important feature. OK, so his point is that in implementing OpenMP using fibers, 
he found that, or they, the team, found that it was very difficult to avoid putting data into fiber local storage. They tried really hard to design the API such that they could avoid it, and um, it made it awkward. Yes? I, I think it's worth, worth stressing that in cooperative multitasking, you just don't have data races, which is a great win. Yep. Right? I mean, the, the only thing that you are risking when you are not doing preemptive multitasking is that you deadlock, right? Because you only have one thread. If somebody really blocks, then uh, all your logic blocks. Right. So the point is that you're not actually um, in risking data races when you have fibers um, that are sharing data. Um, but the, the risk is that you might encounter a deadlock situation more generally, again, if you are running on a fiber and you call an API, which is calling some OS function that blocks the current thread, that's it. No other fibers are going to run on that thread until that API call is complete. So again, it gets down to the question of what does it mean to block my current execution agent? And that problem is being addressed, I hope. <laughs> but that's ongoing work. Um, I saw another hand. No, OK. So a couple of ISO proposals pending. Um, we have a working draft coming out of the concurrency group in ISO. Um, N3721, which takes standard then, sorry, standard future and adds to it a then method um, as a me mechanism for chaining async operations. So um, you have, you initiate some async operation. In this case, I'm using an ASIO blocking operation, but I'm launching it using standard async, so I'm launching it on a separate thread. That returns to me a future. I'm going to chain onto that future a lambda that will initiate another operation. From that, I get a future on which I chain another operation, and then onto that, I chain another operation, and so forth. Ignore the obvious lifespan problems associated with using a local array as a buffer for async operations. That can be addressed with a bit more complexity. My problem is with the form of that code. The then mechanism introduces a DSL for sequencing async operations. Sequencing is good. Sequencing is the the special operator called semicolon in C++. What happens when you need conditionals? What happens when you have to have a loop? I have not myself worked with TPL. I have not worked with the C++ future then extension. I have not exhaustively searched the internet. I cannot claim to have found a statement of zeitgeist. So let's just say that it does not surprise me to have stumbled across a blog post from someone who has been in the trenches lamenting the very thing that worries me about this tactic. In particular, I'm just quoting, <laughs> in particular, .NET's TPL has the defect of making the code overly complex. It is difficult to write robust, readable, and debuggable code with TPL. It is too easy to wind up with spaghetti code, a large number of tasks interconnected in inextricable chains of continuations. I found out the hard way when I was given by my last employer a .NET component to maintain, which had been architected as an incredibly convoluted graph of interconnected TPL tasks, often joined with conditional continue with. It is particularly difficult to write iterations and branches with tasks. 
It turns out that writing a task loop correctly is not trivial, especially if there are many possible error cases or exceptions to handle. It is so tricky that there are MSDN pages that explain what to do and what the possible pitfalls are. What do we actually want from then continuations? We don't want to block the calling thread. That much is clear. Nor do we want to write separate free functions for each stage of processing. We want code that kind of, sort of, if you squint a little, looks almost like ordinary sequential code. A number of people have spoken in the context of future then about the elegance of monadic composition. Though I have read the definition of monads, <laughs> I have clearly not yet understood their power. If you want to try to enlighten me sometime this week, I actually would appreciate that. But for present purposes, that may be a little beside the point. I submit that the real issue, as it always is, is writing robust, maintainable code. I've completely glossed over the fact that WriteSum doesn't promise to write all of the buffer that you hand it, even though I could call a different ASIO method that would make that promise. Let's pretend we're talking about some other async API without that option. Expressing the necessary loop using continuation change suddenly becomes far from trivial. What if we were running this on a fiber? Okay, so I'm using the special ASIO support for fibers. This async call is going to wait until it's done. I mean, this pointer manipulation is what you would do if you were writing ordinary blocking calls. And that's the point. The code looks like you're using ordinary blocking calls. They just don't block the thread. They block only your fiber. The lifespan of the buffer is no longer an issue because we keep this stack frame for as long as this code is executing. And we're using perfectly ordinary C++ loops to manage the problem of partial buffer writes. OK, I promised you that the fiber library includes synchronization primitives. We have mutex, we have barrier, we have condition variable, future promise package task, you've seen a little of that, bounded queue, unbounded queue. Just for il illustrative purposes, let's talk about um, unbounded queue. As you would expect, when the queue is empty and you try to read from it, it blocks the consuming fiber. Other fibers continue running. So let's launch multiple fibers on the thread. Let's say, for sake of argument, that they each are trying to fetch from a different URL. When any is I get the first thing that shows up in the queue. I ignore everything else. When all. I make a point of consuming everything off the queue. That's, you know, that's pretty straightforward. Now, I grant that I may be able to do better than, I may be able to use the lower level primitives to get me something finer grained than queuing up a bunch of results which I ignore. Fair enough. The point is that we have a conceptual model that works for it. I mentioned that there are executor proposals. Um, I say plural because there's the one that's already been floated, um, N3785, and I believe the authors, Google and Microsoft and others, are bringing a new version of that proposal in June. <laughs> you look surprised, okay. Um, moreover, Christopher Koloff, is floating an executor's proposal of his own. Um, this is really interesting because he comes from a different perspective. He's taking the N3964 completion token mechanism and basing his notion of executors <coughs> on that concept. 
It's pretty cool. I'm not sure I've entirely understood it yet. Okay. Yes. Um, you mentioned uh, spring-like primitives. I got a couple issues with that, but one thing that comes to mind immediately is uh, what would be the purpose of a mutex in this context? Okay, so let's consider the two answers. Okay, um, first the question, what, are the, what is the point of synchronization primitives if you're not having data races? So um, there are two answers, and one of them is that the fiber library as presently proposed is dealing with, is able to deal with multiple fibers running on multiple threads. And so you may want to block access to something not only between the fibers on a single thread, but between this fiber on this thread and that fiber on that thread. But I was talking a moment ago about um, the question of can we optimize when any behavior by not even bothering to queue up results and ignoring them. I mean a queue is a conceptually neat model for that. Um, but it's a good case for a, a mutex as well. You could say, okay, my consumer is going to block on this thing until the first result become, becomes available. Somebody is going to toggle the mutex. Maybe a condition variable is a better um, model for that, but it's built on a mutex, right? And, and I have another question about this. Well, I'm, you know, I've seen fibers used, at least Windows fibers used, in cases where they wanted some asynchronicity, but they were having problems avoiding data races. So they said, well, you know, we'll just use the fibers and it keeps our, it, it permits the inversion of control uh -huh. without having to actually address uh, the, real, the data races that we have and hey, then we can move on. And what I'm wondering is if, if you put in these primitives into the, into the fiber namespace, then were you not concerned that people will start writing a lot of code and then deciding that, oh, it's all ready for threads, and then all of a sudden it won't work, and it'll kind of create, I'm going to call it a, a, mixed, a mixed concept of what's going on. It, it, it kind of seems to me confusing. Maybe that's what I want to say. Uh -huh. So the question, <laughs> I'm finally learning. The question is, um, he's seen a, a number of cases where Windows fibers are used to avoid data races, which to me, I mean, that's one of my favorite use cases. I've had to deal with a lot of legacy code. Um, and he talks about, well, now we have a bunch of code which is running on fibers, and we start introducing into that code um, mutexes or any other kind of synchronization in the fiber namespace. And now somebody looks at that code and says, this is already run on a thread. What's the, you know, are we mixing our metaphors? Do we have to go back and refactor that code to use thread level primitives and so forth? And again, I'm going to say that um, there's the short term answer and the longer term answer. The short term answer is that if you are running, um, shall we say, fiber written code, where it's the only fiber on the thread in question, when you need to block that fiber and there's no other fibers on the thread that can run, it blocks the thread. Um, so there is, I, I'll stipulate a tiny amount of overhead for the scheduler to realize that there are no other threads that could run. Um, I'm not sure that would be a big problem in practice. The longer term answer is it's the same it's another facet of the same thing. What does it mean when we want to run something in parallel, when we want to block something, when we want to share access to data? I think that the executor's proposals are going to converge on something that gives us the ability to choose the level of abstraction at which we want to run this code without it having to be hard-coded by specific type into the logic. 
And that's actually kind of intrigues me because that would sort of suggest we would write our code independent of the executor, and that means we would have to include mutexes even though, in fact, we intend to run it as a fiber, and wouldn't we end up kind of eliminating the original elegance that we started with? I kind of want to get you on the email thread that discusses this. <laughs> because these are the questions. Um, and the executor's discussions are ongoing right now. Um, okay, yes. Well, I guess, what you, I guess a lot of the thing is, I mean, for the executors, I mean, there's the loop executor ethic, right? That would basically be like, you know, run everything on a single thread, you get away with the data races, and then when you're ready to go out or, you know, you've got your code stable where, you know, you're either, you know, you probably shouldn't be using like naked mutexes where you're using like, you know, stuff that you know guards it or whatever you you know you spin it up on a rate and a different on the thread pool executor or something you know and you, you know you don't tie yourself down to one thread i'm not sure that i remember all of what he said well enough to repeat it in full but he's saying that um yeah, there are different kinds of executors being proposed um one of them is a loop executor that specifically avoids spinning up distinct threads for the different tasks that you hand to it. Um, and when something is ready to be run more concurrently, you can use a different executor type and, and get it. But he's saying that you probably, in an executor's world, want to avoid using, I love this phrase, naked mutexes in your code. I think that will be the name of my next band. Um, but um, yes, I think that, um, as things presently stand, what I would like to see would be some way of saying, on what executor am I running? And I want it to get for me a queue. I want it to get for me a, a suitable mutex. Um, but this is all very much in flight right now. You're getting the bleeding edge. Uh, I saw a hand over here. Yes. Yes. I doubt it's the efficiency because boost code is stackable. And I don't see an approach to optimize it to stackable. Let me try restating the question. And if I haven't understood it, then correct me. Um, you're saying that it's, you question the efficiency of using a boost stackful coroutine as a generator um, because of the, the construction of the stack to generate these values. Um, and you were saying, I think, that it's not trivial to optimize that to a stackless uh, generator. Yeah, well, so he's saying that um, if the coroutine support is part of the language, then you can ask the compiler to rewrite the coroutine body um, and avoid instantiating a stack for the coroutine. Whereas um, if it's a library edition, then the compiler has no say in it. You're getting what the library provides for you. I would agree with that. Um, I would like to think that, especially with dynamically growing stacks, we can use small stacks by default without crashing code that needs bigger stacks. Um, but my personal bias, I am a fan of stackful coroutines. I love that one of the things I can generate is values out of a recursive data structure. That's um, possible with uh, stackless coroutines, but it's clumsy. I'm not against the stackful coroutines. I, I, I think stackful abstraction is more powerful. Um, but uh, I, I found that if we're only implementing a library, it has some uh, implications to optimize. 
So there is a co. So he's asserting that the um, although the stackful coroutine concept is more powerful than the stackless coroutine concept, um, he is advocating that the compiler that the compiler vendor be involved in the implementation instead of relying on a library because of the flexibility that that gives you. Um, there is a coroutine proposal pending at ISO library at ISO level now. Um, I love the idea that yes, when it is in the hands of the compiler vendors, um, then it's no longer a question of oh gosh, I have to extend support for my library to this new platform that nobody ever told me about before. If there is a compiler, a standard compliant compiler for that, for that machine, it will include this support. It also, I agree, gives the compiler vendor the opportunity to optimize. Um, the thing that I would be... I would rather not annotate uh, functions to be used in coroutines. I would rather they not return futures. That again is personal bias. Yes? So I would like to address your, your comment about stacking these dot dance and this, mm -hmm. that I agree this, this code is not very readable and uh, and, and it's, it's not really how these things are done in Haskell, for instance, where this thing uh, comes from. Uh, Haskell has special syntax for these things, right? And corresponding to the special syntax where you actually don't write your dot dance is uh, resumable functions. That was a proposal into C++ as well. The thing is, though, that if you ignore the monadic binding theory, then you end up with having separately a separate, completely separate solution for coroutines and separate solution for resumable functions, whereas it's really the same pattern mm -hmm. when you think about monads. It's just monadic binding, but written in a, in a nice form that does not require dot then, dot then. I mean, in, in, in Haskell people say, uh, monadic binding is really an overloaded semicolon. And that's what you want, right? Mm -hmm. You want to overload the semicolon to do this stuff for you. Okay, let me see if I can get this one replayed. <laughs> 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 uh, he says that um, he agrees that the string of dot thens is not really uh, any elegant way to present that code. He talks about the idea that in Haskell there is special syntax to uh, permit that kind of semantic without needing the explicit lambdas, et cetera, et cetera. And he talks about the synergy between um, a, future dot, a future colon then and resumable functions. And in Haskell, the uh, resumable functions are, he says, you can regard them as overloaded semicolon which is what I said that I wanted. Yeah, okay. it's called a do block in, in Haskell. Okay, I've seen that in, in reading, but um, do blocks don't yet for me. So, um, yes? Uh, since, since Bart just brought it up, uh, what's your opinion on resume functions? Because, I mean, what you re resume functions essentially are is they take they use the, this then pattern and all this, the articles that, that say, oh, if you want a loop or if you want a conditional, here is how you do that with dot then. Mm -hmm. um, resumable functions basically bake that knowledge into the compiler and the compiler takes your normal C++ code or almost normal C++ code and breaks it up and translates it into these patterns that use dot then. Okay. That's, that's what resumable functions are. They are syntactic transformation, really. And I was wondering what your opinion of that. 
Okay, so the question is, um, what's my opinion of resumable functions? Because instead of doing a lot of work to, to handwrite the code that uh, builds a chain of dot then transformations, the compiler with a resumable function will rewrite the body of the function for you so that it um, emits the code that will do what you would have had to do by hand in a chain of thens, which I think is what Bartosz was saying a moment ago. Um, so if I have the choice of using a library coroutine, a coroutine library to write my code or resumable functions to write my code, I personally would rather use the library, um, the library coroutines, because I'm not annotating things. I'm, I don't have to percolate knowledge of the asynchronous nature of what I'm doing down through each level of function call that I might, in which I might encounter it. I'm not returning a future. Um, Chandler. Okay. It seems to me that if this, if I want to introduce a resumable function at some low level in my call tree, I have to touch a lot of code that, that wouldn't otherwise need to be changed in order to make it all aware of the asynchronous nature of what I'm doing. I would rather not do that. If I'm working with a large code base, I'd rather that the top level know that it's launching a fiber and the bottom level know that it's dealing with asynchronous I.O. and nothing else in between should need to know. That's my personal opinion. Okay, thanks. A lot of what you're saying, I mean, I guess, you know, the big, the big example would be like, say you wrote, a, you know, using resumable functions, a, um, you know, asynchronous, you know, I.O. stream. You can't use that with like the copy algorithm because it doesn't know that, you know, when it returns, it, it's, you know, it's a future. Right. It doesn't know that it's a future. So you'd have to rewrite all your, you know, things to be able to deal with that. Whereas this one would actually, it would work. If you, if you did it right with code teams, it would block, it would not block that, but it would come out of it and resume at each step. Okay, so he was making the point that um, if you don't have to annotate things, then you get better adaptability, better compatibility with existing code. Um, and he talked about the STL copy algorithm, for instance. Chandler has been waiting. I'm not trying to endorse the resumable functions particularly, but during the discussions in, in uh, committee, uh, it has come up several times that the annotation is not necessary. No. That there's nothing about the feature which requires the annotation on the function that was uh, actually added at a request of some programmers that wanted that annotation, annotation removed, that the request of other programmers who didn't want it added back. Um, it, it, it's not intrinsic to the proposal. Uh, the core of the proposal merely requires the signature of the function to return a future. Because the use of the resumable uh, expression inside of the function causes the function to return a future to caller. And so the API of the function has to be written in terms of futures before you can you can introduce a resume a, res, a resumption point into it. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Um, so Chandler's point is that the annotation um, on the resumable functions themselves and on the operations within them isn't strictly necessary. The compiler can actually examine things and figure it out. There are Evidently, um, two diverging schools of thought on this. Some coders wanted the annotation in and it's there by their request. Others, like myself, think that it's um, obtrusive, intrusive, especially in a larger code base. Um, and it, Chandler was saying that all that's necessary is that the function signature return a future. And I guess one more anecdote. Um, I in college uh, was intrigued even then by the 
question of concurrency in a higher level language. And so I wrote a preprocessor that could be used for a PL1 program that would, when you asked to block, return through however many levels of function call you had. It was sort of the Duff's device thing as generalized to multiple levels of function call. It generated um, abhorrent code and it returned all the way back to the event loop and called all the way back down and was horrible. And whenever I think of what resumable functions are doing when they block, I think of that. I've probably got the concept wrong, but um, that will have to be taken offline because I think we're out of time. Thank you all for coming.